Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Um, welcome to Mythos Labs' webinar on Russia's information war against Ukraine, evolving narratives, tactics, and goals. My name is Faiza Saeed, and I'm a manager at Mythos Labs. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just go over some um, housekeeping. So this webinar is being recorded. And if you are interested in receiving um, a copy of the recording afterwards, please email uh, the email address that is going to be shared in the chat right now. Um, and at any point during the webinar, if you have a question for the panelists, please type it and send it using the Q&A button on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Uh, during the final 15 minutes of the webinar, our speakers will try to address your questions um, as they can. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to the moderator for this webinar, Mr. Priyank Mathur. So Priyank is the founder and CEO of Mythos Labs, a social enterprise that uses technology and media to counter mis disinformation and online harm. He's the co-author of Mythos Labs' reports, investigating pro-Russian disinformation and propaganda about Ukraine. And his research has been featured on BBC, Le Monde, Huffington Post, Newsweek, and other global outlets. Uh, previously, Priyank served as a policy advisor and intelligence analyst at the US Department of Homeland Security, where he advised senior leadership on emerging terrorists and cyber threats. He also served as global consulting director at Ogilvy & Neto, where he created award-winning digital advertising campaigns for Fortune 500 firms. And he was also a comedy writer at The Onion. He holds an MBA from MIT uh, Sloan School of Management, as well as an MA and BA in international relations from Boston University. So over to you, Priyank. Thank you very much, Faiza. Welcome to all our attendees and our esteemed panelists. In the weeks and months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, the world watched Russia conduct a massive buildup of troops and military equipment at the border with Ukraine. We all still remember watching videos, disturbing videos and satellite imagery on the news showing large columns of Russian tanks and armored vehicles slowly but steadily advancing towards Kyiv. What was harder to see at the time, but perhaps no less important, was the buildup of troops that was happening not on the ground, but in cyberspace. In November of 2021, three months before the invasion, Researchers at Mythos Labs found that the activity of accounts spreading pro-Russian disinformation and propaganda about Ukraine increased by 3,300%. From January to November of 2021, accounts spreading pro-Russian disinfo were posting, on average, six tweets a day about Ukraine. But in November of 2021, that figure jumped to 213 tweets per day. At first, the goal of this surge in information warfare seemed to be to distract and conceal. Most of these accounts were treating pro-Russian disinformation and propaganda that dismissed warnings of a Russian invasion as warmongering and fear-mongering by the West. But on February 24th, 2022, when Russia officially launched its invasion, it was clear that this buildup of bots and online propagandists had been no coincidence. Instead, it was part of a coordinated war effort by Russia, one that placed information warfare at the heart of a strategy to achieve military and geopolitical goals. Now, a lot has changed since the invasion began six months ago. Faced with heavy resistance from the Ukrainian armed forces and from the people of Ukraine, Russia has been forced to abandon its initial plan of a quick takeover of Kyiv and has had instead to settle for a more limited conflict in the eastern and southern parts of the country. The war has also had far-reaching and international effects that have reshaped major global dynamics from energy markets to food security to migration patterns. And as conditions on the ground have changed, so too have the narratives, tactics, and goals of Russia's information war. So to discuss where we are today and where we're likely headed, I'm joined by a very distinguished group of speakers each of whom is playing an active and important role in combating Russian disinformation and propaganda about Ukraine. It is my honor to introduce you to our speakers for this webinar, and I'd like to start with Ms. Olga Tokaryuk. Olga is an independent journalist 
and non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis based in Ukraine. Her professional interests include international relations and disinfo research. She's the lead author of Mythos Labs' reports on Russian disinformation and propaganda related to Ukraine, which have been featured on BBC, Le Monde, Huffington Post, Newsweek, and other major outlets. Olga has vast experience working with Ukrainian as well as international media. Her reporting has been published by Time, The Washington Post, Daily Beast, NPR, and many other organizations across Europe. She is the former head of Foreign News Desk at the independent Ukrainian Romatsky TV, and she's also co-authored an investigative documentary about a controversial trial of Ukrainian soldier Vitaly Markiv in Italy. And she's published a research paper on the role of dis disinformation in this case. She's a former scholar of the Digital Sherlock's program at the Atlantic Council's DFR lab and holds an MA in political science and international relations from the University of Bologna, as well as an MA in journalism from the Taras Shevchenko University of Kiev. Next, we have Dr. Vladimir Yermolenko. Here is a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and writer. He is the analytics director at Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest and oldest Ukrainian media NGOs, as well as the editor in chief of UkraineWorld.org. He also serves as an associate professor at Kiev Moyla Academy, and his work has been published in The Economist, Le Monde, Financial Times, New York Times, Newsweek, Al Jazeera, and many more. Vladimir specializes in information analysis and media literacy. He's published many fiction and nonfiction books and has won several awards, including the Miroslav Popovich Prize, Petro Moyla Prize, Yuri Shevilov Prize, and Book of the Year Prize in Ukraine. Additionally, he's a member of the Board of International Renaissance Foundation, as well as a member of the Supervisory Board of the Ukrainian Institute. I'd also now like to introduce Dr. John Rosenbeek. John is the British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the Cambridge Social Decision-Making Lab. His research focuses on misinformation, vaccine hesitancy, online extremism, and information warfare. As part of his work, he has co-developed the award-winning fake news games, Bad News, and Harmony Square, as well as Go Viral. His doctoral dissertation examined media discourse in Eastern Ukraine, and he's currently writing a book about propaganda and information warfare during the Russo-Ukrainian War, titled Influence, Information, and War in Ukraine, which will be published in 2023. And lastly, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Tawhid Zaman. Tawhid is Chief Technologist at Mythos Labs and an Associate Professor of Operations Management at the Yale School of Management. He received his Bachelor of Science, Master's of Engineering, and PhD degrees in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering from MIT. His research focuses on solving operational problems involving social network data using probabilistic models, network algorithms, and modern statistical methods. Some of the topics he studies in the social network space include predicting the popularity of content, finding online extremists, and geolocating users. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Wired, Mashable, LA Times, and Time Magazine. So welcome to all our panelists and of course to our attendees who are joining us. Uh, I'd like to get right into it and start with where we are and how we got here. So to that, my first question is directed at you, Olga, but I invite our other panelists to contribute as well. You've been researching, Olga, pro-Russian disinformation for many years, long before this invasion started in 2022. Could you tell us a little bit about what are the major narratives, the disinformation propaganda narratives that Russia is trying to spread on social media and how might they have changed since the start of the invasion to where we are now. Yes, thank you, Priyank. And you know, thank you for organizing this event with such a distinguished uh, set of speakers. I'm really honored to be uh, one of them today. And uh, you know, the, the question of narratives and the narratives that were pushed by Russian and this information machine before the war is very relevant because many of those, rel uh, of those narratives are still the same and are still continue being pushed by uh, the Russian disinformation machine and by Russian officials. For example, take the narrative that Ukraine is a country full of Nazis or Ukraine is a country run by Nazis. It, this is something that Russia has been uh, pushing for years. And this is also one of the justifications of so-called special military operation. Uh, in fact, the full-scale war that uh, Russian president dictator Putin used as a justification for launching this war on the, uh, on the night of February 24th. 
So, uh, you know, uh, this is also one of the narratives that we very often see being repeated by uh, Russian uh, disinformation actors on social media, including Twitter. So Ukrainians are Nazis and Russians are fighting uh, Nazism in Ukraine. Uh, then uh, some other narratives that were present since 2014, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, the next Crimea and launched, launched the uh, uh, military uh, offensive in parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine. So the narratives that were used uh, then uh, that are still repeated today are, for example, Ukrainian armed forces commit uh, war crimes and target civilians. And this is a narrative that Russia keeps repeating very often and also uh, trying to back it up with, uh, uh, you know, quoting some international organizations or human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, because there was a controversy recently about a report by Amnesty International that blamed Ukrainian armed forces for endangering civilians, because allegedly, according to this report, they were using schools and, and hospitals uh, as military facilities. There was a lot of controversy about this report because it turned out, well, actually that the uh, sample of the Amnesty, the people they spoke with was very narrow and uh, it, 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 it didn't offer any alternative alternative, uh, uh, what else uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces should do in, in such a situation when there is an all-out war and civilians often refuse to, to leave. So Russian propaganda machine used uh, this report um, to uh, again, uh, confirm and, you know, spread, push the narrative that Ukrainians are willingly endangering civilians. Russian officials quoted it at the United Nations and, of course, it was spread uh, very widely on social media. Uh, then uh, some other narratives that were present and are still there, Western sanctions on Russia are not working and backfire on the countries that implemented them, that introduced them. Um, uh, Ukrainians and President Zelensky are warmongers and want to drag the West into the World War III. This is something that emerged after this full-scale invasion. Uh, some other um, new narratives is, for example, about the Western weapons in Ukraine. A very a common narrative is that Western weapons that are provided to Ukraine are making no difference on the battlefield and they go missing or uh, are resolved on, at the black market. Again, these claims have no basis in fact. Uh, and of course, uh, some, you know, the narratives that were where they are previously that are still continued. This is a denial of Russian attacks on civilians, of Russian bombings uh, of uh, civilians in Mariupol and elsewhere in Ukraine, uh, hiding losses of the Russian army, of Russian military, um, and as it, uh, you know, no reporting or very um, uh, little mention of the sinking of Moscow ship, for example, or uh, Ukrainian strikes on Crimea. Um, one recently emerged narrative and that is getting more and more traction is that Russia is fighting not with the Ukrainian army, but with NATO and the West in Ukraine. So, of course, well, it was present even before this war was portrayed in Russia uh, as the war between Russia and the West with Ukrainians mere proxies and objects in this war. Uh, but this narrative is gaining more traction as, you know, uh, Russia is increasingly trying to justify its losses and its failures in Ukraine with the fact that, in fact, it's not the Ukraine. Ukrainian army has uh, put up a strong resistance and is very efficient in repelling Russian attacks, but this is in fact uh, NATO army, NATO uh, weapons, NATO instructors who are fighting. Uh, in, in terms of the change of narratives, as I said, part of the narratives are still the same that were there before. There were uh, additional narratives added. I think the major uh, change is that uh, currently there is less warmongering on uh, by this Russian disinformation account, so less reports about Russian military successes and, and victories, and more anti-Western rhetoric. That's how the, the narratives are changing at this point. Thank you, Olga. That is uh, that is definitely fascinating. And I, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Volodymyr. Um, I, I believe you're in Kiev right now. Um, you know, it must be uh, surreal to have seen a lot of the changes that Olga is talking about and, and happening on the ground as well, both of you having been in Ukraine this, this time. Um, Volodymyr, you, you have written about uh, the historical context of this invasion and, and, and some of the underlying uh, philosophical um, trends and, and maybe causes, the root causes of this. I'd like to ask you about the goal. This has been referred to many times as Putin's war. And if that's the case, then it's also Putin's information war. So what is his ultimate goal, do you think, um, in waging this information war? Is it to erase a sense 
of Ukrainian national identity? Or is it to try and instead build a sense of pan-Russian identity among Ukrainians? Or is it a bit of both or something else altogether? Thank you, Priyank. It's indeed a, a big honor and joy to, uh, to talk with you. And I always try to use any opportunity to talk to people outside of Ukraine and to have dialogue with them. And uh, responding to your question, of course, it's not Putin's war. I think uh, almost every Ukrainian would oppose this definition because uh, it's not Putin who personally who came to Bucha and, and was killing uh, over 400 of Ukrainian civilians and torturing them. It's not Putin who is who would uh, send the 500 kilogram bomb on the Borodyanka nine floor residential buildings, killing dozens of people. It's not Putin personally who is has shelled the uh, the shopping mall in Kremenchuk, and we can go on and go on with this. Unfortunately, if we look at this, at the public opinion polls in Russia, we see the, uh, the the big support for this war, and we should really understand what is going on in in in, in the minds of the Russian Russian people. I don't want to say that um, every Russian is is responsible for that, but at least there is, of course, a, a kind of a collective idea inside Russia, which is supported by the majority of people, which would either uh, ref refuse from judging, from making his or her own judgments about the war, and we see it from the uh, from the lots of news reports from Russia when people are just saying, "Okay, I'm not interested in politics," or if Putin decided to make this war, then it is just decision they know better than us. Or it's it's a conscious, conscious support of this. Now, uh, why is that happening? I think, and here we come indeed in the, into the core of, of, of the problem. Uh, one thing is that Russia really uh, proceeds right now with an absolutely alternative project, political project uh, than Ukraine. In the, in, the, in the past decades, Ukraine was going through the process of decommunization, of decolonization, of de-imperialization, uh, and finally de-Russification as a consequence of, of all that. I think Russia is, was going through the process of re-communization and re-imperialization and recolonization. And that's very interesting that we, uh, that we understand it. For example, one of the Russian narratives, as you know, is that this war is, is because of NATO enlargement and the NATO just, uh, uh, just threatens Russia. But uh, I, would, I would pose the question in a different way. If NATO would not have enlarged in the 90s and 2000s, where would this war be going on right now? And my hypothesis is that it would be going on not only in Ukraine, but in the Baltic states, in Poland, in, in Slovakia, uh, in Czech Republic, and in some other states. And we know this from history. Uh, and if you want me to elaborate on that, I, I can do that. So we are not facing with the problem of, of the West's enlargement. I think the, the, the West was kind of tired of enlargement around the 2000s, somewhere, somewhere around 2007. And at this point, Russia was tired of non-enlargement, of its non-expansion. And it started the new expansionist project. And here we, we see just the consequences of that. Coming back to the Ukrainian identity, there are two issues. The issues of kind of a national identity and I think the issue of a political identity. For the national identity, I think there is a strong feeling in Russia, among Russians, is that if they do not own Ukraine, if they do not possess Ukraine, they would not be Russians. So th there is a feeling that they can only be Russians if they keep Ukraine uh, in, inside their country, because they developed a mythology of the past, which basically puts the roots of very idea of being Russian in Kyiv, in the medieval state of the so-called Rus, which was not Russia, which was organized in a very similar way maybe than current Ukraine is organized. I mean, decentralized and uh, very pluralistic, uh, but but Russians just linked with them with uh, them themselves with this myth mythology and they are dependent on this. 
Another, another question which I'm asking, if Russians do not persuade Ukrainians that Ukrainians are Russians, and, and we see that they cannot persuade us anymore, uh, how they can persuade other ethnicities which are in Russia, which are ethnically much more far away from, from the Russians, which are not Slavic, which can be Turkic, which can be uh, uh, Mongolic, which can be Ugrofins or whatever. We know that Russia is a construct, is an empire and not a nation state, which collects all these colonies inside itself. And the second issue is, of course, political. It, it relates to political identity because we should very look very deep into history, understand that in Eastern, what is going now is also the battle for Eastern Europe, the battle for the idea of Eastern Europe. And there are two ideas of Eastern Europe. One is imperial and tyrannical. The other is, I would call it Republican from this Latin word, Respublica, the common, common thing, common, uh, common affair. Uh, common polity. And if we go to the medieval ages, I would say that Ruiz centered in Kiev was, was much more Republican than Imperial. If we look at the uh, other statehoods here up until the 17th century, the great duty of Lithuania, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, in all of them, the this uh, uh, Proto-Ukrainian element was very important. They were all thinking of themselves primarily as republics, not as empires and, and tyrannies. And this political culture went through the all the political idea of Ukraine. If you want me to describe Ukrainian political idea in one word, I would say that this is a struggle for anti-tyrannical political culture, anti-tyrannical politics, anti-tyrannical society. And obviously there is a, a big clash between Russian idea of politics and society and Ukrainian one. That is fascinating, thank you. I, I do remember reading that you had written recently um, that uh, freedom is the key trait of Ukraine's identity as a political nation. And I think uh, this, this uh, dichotomy that you set up between them and what Russia represents to them is very interesting and will play a defining role in, in the war. So you, you talked about the question you asked is how do they intend to persuade different ethnicities? And just on that broader subject of how are they trying to persuade people, I'd like to turn now to John, uh, Dr. Rosenbeek. You, you have uh, uh, been looking at Russian tactics for spreading disinformation propaganda for many years, again, far before this conflict. Um, what are some of the, and you're writing a book, uh, which will be out soon called The Psychology of Misinformation, which is, I think, very, very interesting indeed. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the psychological tactics that um, pro-Russian actors have used or are using to spread propaganda and disinformation, maybe not just in this conflict, but even what you saw among separatist leaders in, in Donetsk and Luhansk um, before mm -hmm. this current invasion? Yeah, so, so just to give a bit of context for my PC dissertation, I looked at media, um, mainly news websites and newspapers beside the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk over a period of four years, between 2014 and 2018. Um, and what I looked at was, okay, so these so-called republics consider themselves to be independent nominally from Ukraine, or at the very least, not part of Ukraine, right? And so what justifications are offered for that uh, separation? Right now, obviously it's true that these were never so sort of independent republics to begin with because they were, they exist by the grace of Russia and exclusively by the grace of Russia. But nonetheless, uh, it is true that they did set up a, a whole sort of media landscape aimed at persuasion of some kind, I, I would argue. And what you see very clearly is um, normal sort of traditional, I suppose, independence movements, such as the one in Catalonia or Scotland, right, but there's many, um, have some kind of discourse about what makes them different from the country that they want to remove themselves from, right? meaning they have a, a, a group identity that stands apart from the group identity or group identities of the, uh, of the state that they want to break away from. And usually you have a pretty clear story about what that is, right? Language, maybe um, different history, uh, ethnicity might be different and so on and so on. Um, but here you didn't see that in the slightest, meaning there were hints of an eternal identity being promoted by the authorities of the so-called People's Republics, uh, but it was very sparse, uh, it was very limited, and it wasn't very coherent. 
meaning they would jump from one thing to another. One day it's Novorossiya, New Russia. The next day it's Malorossiya, Little Russia. Um, then it's uh, the legacy of the so-called Donetsk Riviri uh, People's Republic, which existed for maybe a few months in 1917, right? Capital of it was Kharkiv, by the way, so not part of the People's Republic. Um, and so this, this internal identity really wasn't being constructed at all. As far as I could tell, there were no consistent efforts undertaken to persuade, especially the local population, that there was an alternative to Ukrainian nationhood that was very coherent. Um, now, partially, you could argue that this was the case primarily after the uh, MH17 uh, disaster in July 2014, right, which uh, was a major setback uh, in terms of the legitimacy, if you want to call it that, it wasn't exactly that, but whatever legitimacy building was being done prior to that kind of ended with the MH17 disaster. But especially after that, you didn't see much of this discourse at all, all stories about we are different from Ukraine, here's why, um, disappeared and were replaced completely by um, what you call outgroup animosity. And so Olga uh, just described this very clearly as well, I think, where the idea is, it's not that we are different from Ukraine uh, and we're a different group and have always been a different group. Rather, Ukraine is uh, full of war criminals and Nazis and horrible people. Therefore, um, you should be afraid. Therefore, we don't want to be part of Ukraine, right? Which is a very different story than there's an identity that we have that they don't have. Therefore, we feel that we are part of a different group. Um, and so it turns out that this particular strategy uh, now, you might have all, all sorts of things to say about it, but what is interesting, I think, is that um, recent research from, from last year by some of my colleagues shows that this type of language, sort of derogatory language about the other group, uh, goes viral very well, meaning that gets shared a lot, right? Now, I would personally argue that that is in no way a stand-in for identity building whatsoever, but if you have nothing else to go on, that's possibly how you generate some level of sort of coherence among the people that you're trying to sort of persuade that the other side is bad, if that makes sense, or, and not so much that your side is good. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that has been partially successful, but not exactly all that successful. Also, because if you look at opinion polling, for instance, in Donbass, um, let's say in 2019, there was a really good large-scale poll conducted by a researcher at Oxford named Gwendolyn Sass, uh, Sass S-A-S-S-E. Um, and what she found was uh, people of Donbass, outside of the so-called People's Republic, support for the Russian Federation, joining the Russian Federation in some capacity, no longer being part of Ukraine, hovered around 4%, uh, which isn't a lot. And within the People's Republics, it wasn't a majority either meaning the majority continued to prefer, even after so many years of propaganda, remaining part of Ukraine. And that, for me, also speaks to the failure of these, uh, these propaganda efforts, in the sense that there hasn't really been a very successful effort at convincing Ukrainians that they're better off with Russia, right? And if I may speculate, I think that's a very broad problem that Russia has, uh, because the Kazakhs don't really want to be part of the Russian orbit either, as you can tell from what President Tokayev currently is doing. Um, Belarus always seems to be at the brink of revolution, right? All the Baltic countries, for obvious reasons, as soon as they have the opportunity to do so, they got as far away from Russia as they could. Meaning this idea, and, and Volodymyr uh, uh, spoke about this as well just now, of a, a popularity of, of, of Russianness, if you will, um, pulling power is minimal, I would argue. Thank you, thank you. Um, th that is uh, definitely a lot to take in. And, and it's interesting to note some of the similarities and differences. You, you talked, the sense I got is that even earlier on, the separatist republics were more concerned with, with vilifying the they than building a sense of us, or they were more successful perhaps, and less unsuccessful at that. Um, 
And, and I do, you talked about negative information going viral more likely. I remember there was a study by MIT about how fake rumors, particularly derogatory rumors, travel seven times faster on social media um, than legitimate news. And speaking of MIT, I now turn to uh, a former professor at MIT, uh, Tawheed Zaman. Um, Tawheed, you have been approaching this problem of misinformation and online harms from a purely technological perspective. You've developed some systems that use AI to track inauthentic accounts to expose their activity. Um, talk to us a little bit about how bad actors, such as pro-Russian groups that are spreading disinfo and propaganda about Ukraine, are using technology to create inauthentic accounts. Do you see evidence that this is being done in an automated and systematic manner? Yeah, so in the Ukraine discussion, right, we collected a, a bunch of bots and it was kind of funny. So our algorithm find bots that are basically retweeting excessive rates in the discussion, basically kind of anomalous, non-human behavior. And these accounts are kind of funny. So if you check when they're created, they weren't created all of a sudden, like, you know, right before the war started. They've been created steadily at a rate of about two per week since 2009. So the accounts talking today about the Ukrainian uh, and Russian conflict, they've been born every week for the past like 13, 14 years. Uh, there's a couple of years when the, the creation rate kind of got very high. So in 2011, uh, 2014, and also 2020, 2021, the rate of creation doubled. So I think those years are years of maybe uh, something about the Russians was, and Ukraine had kind of uh, gotten intense. I think 2014 was the I think the uh, the Euromaidan revolution, I think, I'm not sure about the actual historical context, but maybe Olga could chime in. But yeah, there's like spikes of creation in certain years, but then it's just steady every single week, about two bots per week. So whoever is building this army is building it slowly and steadily over time. Now, if you're doing that, it's kind of impressive because Twitter has changed the way uh, you can create new accounts. So back in the old days, and the old days means before 2016, uh, creating Twitter accounts is very easy. I remember in my group, one of my students actually created a thousand fake Twitter accounts just using fake uh, Google voice numbers, right? So I call that the Wild West. So those are the good old days. After 2016, uh, it became very hard to make a fake Twitter account. You need an actual legitimate phone number to create an account. And so for more recent research using like bots to persuade people about different things in social media, we can only create like a few accounts to do the experiments. So for me as a researcher in academia, making a Twitter account is kind of a chore, but if I'm maybe a nation state with a bigger budget, then creating a bunch of fake Twitter accounts might be much easier. So I think uh, the cost of making the bots increased. However, I think the technology that the, that the bots utilize is much more sophisticated. So today's bots or tomorrow's bots could be a lot more intelligent than the previous bots because yesterday and today, the bots mainly just retweet other accounts and amplify certain uh, narratives that are out there in the, in the media. But with the way AI is developing, I think in the next couple of years, the bots actually say things that sound coherent that you can't tell it's actually a bot. Um, for the Ukrainian bots, certain patterns we know that are interesting. So these bots are multilingual in that they don't just retweet articles in a certain language, they retweet articles in many languages. So on average, these uh, bots, they're tweeting in like 14 or 15 different languages. The main languages are English and Russian, but also other languages like French, Spanish, uh, German, et cetera. And their main language of, of uh, usage actually changed over time. So before the invasion, these bots, they mostly talk in Russian. I think about 60% of their tweets were in Russian. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, once the war starts, these bots are tweeting mostly in English. Like half the tweets are now in English and Russian is more like 30% of the content. So something made them switch their language of choice uh, after the invasion started. And if you see who they're actually retweeting in English, uh, a lot of the accounts I didn't recognize, they're just basically these kind of anti-establishment independent journalists. Um, but some of the names would just sound kind of familiar. So if you follow in the Twitter space, uh, Zero Hedge is it a prominent a libertarian account, talks about financial news. So they can amplify quite a bit by these Russian, uh, these Russian bots. And also uh, Glenn Greenwald, who is a journalist who is very critical of the U.S. military, uh, he gets amplified quite a bit. And if you study disinformation, uh, a gentleman named Jack Rosobiak also is amplified quite a bit. And what they're amplifying is these people talk about how the Russian invasion or the Ukrainian war is kind of, you know, uh, instigated by the West. Uh, they have this narrative uh, recently that uh, the war is causing prices of gas to go up in Europe, and Europe is going to be paying the penalty for this invasion. And... Uh, you see this kind of narrative as being uh, 
pushed by like mostly the right wing in America, but they kind of align with the, I guess the Russian narratives. And so these bots seem to be amplifying those types of messages. I wouldn't say these Russian, these are right wing uh, pundits are like intentionally trying to help the Russians, but their narratives just kind of align with the Russian narrative. And so the bots today, they seem like they're a fan of the American right wing, which is kind of interesting. So that is, that is interesting. And you talked about the bots of tomorrow. I think a lot of people know generally that AI is getting more sophisticated, but can you just specify specific, there's something that some of you may have heard of, uh, OpenAI, a company funded by Elon Musk has released something called GPT-3, which is a text generation AI, and it can create very human-like sounding text and tweets and posts. Um, you've got Dolly 2, which is image generation AI. You give it a prompt and it creates a, a painting or an image or a photograph that looks like it was taken by a human. Are, are, are you saying that technologies like that can be used um, by bots to create content that is so indistinguishable from humans, there will be really no way of telling it was made by a machine or a person? Oh, for sure. So I teach a class at Yale School of Management on social media analytics. And one of my class lectures is actually using GPT-3 to generate uh, fake tweets and to show them how easy it is. So to get a sense of how powerful the tech is today, if you go to GPT-3 and just type in, write a tweet uh, critical of Ukraine uh, in the voice of a woman, right? It'll write a tweet about that topic in that particular voice. And the tweet will sound just like that person wrote it. So generating fake content that kind of fits a narrative is actually trivial today. So I think the bots of tomorrow could just like, you know, have a, a bot operator, right? Go to some tech like GPT-3 and put in a general query, right? Write a tweet about such and such thing with certain such sentiment. And it'll generate hundreds and hundreds of messages, right? And you could just have those fed to different bot accounts and and tweeted and it'll appear as if there's genuine uh you know human beings that are like you know aligning with your particular narrative on ai dolly too that you mentioned is even more terrifying so that thing you type in like a query like draw a picture i mean the innocuous queries are draw a picture of a cat playing ping pong on the moon and it'll draw that kind of creative picture and it'll look just like the thing you described those are kind of the fun examples they like to uh advertise but if you really sinister in your thinking you can do a lot of fun things with it i remember one time i tried uh in my class live just for fun i said let's draw a picture of russian tanks rolling through kiev and actually to my uh pleasant surprise the ai says we cannot draw that picture that is uh controversial or dangerous so dolly too i think uh open ai realized how, how powerful it is you can't make like these war propaganda uh, images with dolly too like Russian tanks going through Ukraine, a fake picture of that, they can't do that. However, you can do just tanks rolling through a city and then just in, on the caption, when, when you tweet it, here is the Russian tanks going through Kiev, the war is over, they should give it up. So that can happen today. Um, and I'm for sure like tomorrow and tomorrow being like maybe you know, a year because uh, the tech is getting really good really fast that the really sophisticated bots are just gonna look like people, right? And to so that's going to be a much more terrifying kind of environment to be in. And we're going to be there sooner than you think. Well, that is that is indeed terrifying. And, and I think moderation of this kind of content will be almost impossible. Yes, you can say you're not allowed to talk about Russian tanks. But as Olga and John and Volodymyr and you know, um, so much of the propaganda is much more subtle than that. It can be a picture of a starving child and you can talk about, you know, the uh, food crisis that Ukraine has manufactured or whatever. So I think the, the infinite possibilities um, of how you can create propaganda using these tools are beyond the reach of any sort of censorship by the tech companies, at least so far. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I feel like maybe I've, I've done something bad here. Is I've, if you're in the audience and you like, like this information, I've told you how to get around Dolly 2's like, limitations. Just generic pictures of stuff will be okay, but specific people will not be possible. So just- well, We're yeah. hoping no one in the audience is going to- uh, Yeah, take you use up the tech for good people. Yeah. But just coming back, and I know we just have about five more minutes before we want to take questions, five or 10 more minutes. So uh, just to circle back on where we're headed, Tawheed gave us a good introduction of where the technology is headed. It's it's going in a rather scary direction when it comes to the potential for how you can manipulate information online. Um, but coming back to you, uh, Olga, 
Um, as Tawhid also mentioned, languages have shifted. There's new target audiences. Our own research that you and I co-authored um, in June, uh, a paper talking about how the share of Spanish language tweets that is being put out by accounts spreading pro-Russian disinfo and propaganda has more than tripled since March to June of 2022. Um, many of these directed at audiences in Latin America, calling the Americans gringos for what they're trying to do in Ukraine and comparing it to American imperialism in Latin America. Similarly, there's been Russian influence campaigns in India, Africa, across the Middle East. Um, there's been a 680% increase in the number of uh, pro uh, account spreading pro-Russian disinformation and propaganda that are retweeting official Chinese state affiliated accounts. So you are seeing, um, lots and lots of examples of, of a diversifying global audience. Do you think, Olga, we should be worried about this? Is this a deliberate strategic move by the Russians to try and win sympathy in, in the broader non-Western world? Or is this maybe a sign of desperation that their initial strategy of trying to talk in English to Western audiences and even Russian speaking audiences in Ukraine uh, didn't really work? They're not convincing anyone there. So now they're just trying to get support wherever they can. So, Olga, are you- I here? think Olga, Olga was a little bit out, right? Did you hear the Sorry, question? Yeah, my, my connection just dropped and I was temporarily uh, Let me jump so in please. then, Priyanka. Sure. I, I will take this question and then we'll, we'll let Olga think about it and maybe uh, add something. So look, uh, if, if we look at Russian uh, disinformation strategy, we see that one of its uh, very important tools is polarization, right? Uh, polarization of the internal politics. That's what was happening in Ukraine already in the 2000s, in the in the, in the 2000s. Then uh, you suddenly realize that this uh, strategy is tested in other countries. In Britain, for example, during the uh, Brexit referendum in the United States, you all know this better than us, in, in, in Poland, in, in some other countries. Now, I think Russia is now doing the same for the whole world. And uh, it's trying to polarize the whole world. And uh, sometimes we should take seriously uh, what they're talking about. Uh, when they were talking about the new European security order, if you remember this so-called ultimatum in autumn uh, 2021, just before this full-scale invasion, uh, I think we should take it seriously. That's that's exactly what they want to, to, to achieve. And the new European security order for them was to split Europe in half, as Europe was split in half after the Second World War, to have two pillars of the European security, one, the pillar, uh, let's say, American pillar, NATO pillar, and another one which will be controlled by the Russians. I think they're trying to do the same with the world right now. And basically they're trying to play the game, uh, the, the worse image they would have in the West, the better they will feel in, in other countries, which are kind of a feeling that the West was, was also an imperialist power, which was doing a lot of harm, which was also doing a lot of violence. So we should really see it as a, as a strategy. And when we look at those countries that you mentioned, uh, Latin America or Indonesia or China or, or, or Africa, whatever, I think we will increasingly have this picture. Russia really wants to be the leader of this anti-Western world. And coming to this, what, what John was saying, this is very remarkable because we see actually the that not only these so-called separatist republics do, do not have their identity, Russia itself doesn't have its identity. And that's, that's something we should really talk about. Uh, what I mean by that is that you might, for example, assume that Russian current identity is an anti-Western, right? They're, they're showing themselves as, as the opponents of the West. They're reviving this old Eurasianist ideology of the 1920s, which would say that Russia is a separate civilization, which has absolutely different tools from the, from the Western civilization. And those Eurasianists, which are now revived by people like Dugin and others, uh, would be saying that Russian roots are rather in the nomadic tribes of the Eurasian steppes, 
uh, than in the in the Western European culture. Okay, we should, we can uh, we can um, accept this narrative, right? And and say, okay, you you are considering yourself as different. But what they are saying right now, they are not saying that they are anti-democratic. They are saying they are genuine democracy. When you look at the current narratives of Russia against Ukraine, this is this is really schizophrenic because they are saying that look, Ukraine is getting totalitarian. Zelensky is a totalitarian leader, and Ukraine is a country of slaves, which do not have a say in the politics. Well, this is the mirror reflection of what Ukrainians are now saying about Russians. With, with, the, with the little difference is that Ukraine, we can check it on facts, is a, is a genuine democracy, which, which, ha, which has freedom of speech, at least had before this, this invasion, before the martial law, and which was changing its presidents very, very regularly, as we know, and which was providing the, really the plurality and checks and balances, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the paradox, the in, in internal skies of uh, which, which is present in Russia. And I just want to say to address those people in non-Western uh, countries to which they are addressing, don't believe this Russian narrative that they are a big anti-imperialist force. Uh, we know that the West was and has been and maybe is imperialistic in, in, in many ways. We Ukrainians understand that. We, we know the history of European colonialism of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, but I think there is a slight difference right now. The Western democracies, the debate about this in the Western democracies is possible. The uh, accusation of the Western powers is possible. The condemnation of the wars, of the colonial wars, of the, of the Vietnam War, of the Iraq invasion is possible. None of it is possible in Russia. You cannot disguise the Chechen wars in Russia uh, uh, objectively. You cannot disguise the 19th century uh, Caucasian wars in Russia objectively, and you cannot disguise the, discuss the Ukraine invasion right now. So Russia is not an anti-imperialist force, it's one of the most horrible empires in the human history, and, uh, and uh, it's obviously the last empire in, in Europe. So Russia is now putting a question upon this big de-imperialization process which was going on. Uh, in the world in the 20th century. Russia wants to revise it. Russia wants to come back to the world, which is divided by empires. And for example, come back to the bipolar world. And we should just understand it. Great, thank you. And just in the interest of time, I, I do wanna hear more from you uh, as well, John um, and Olga. Uh, first, I should say, Olga, um, uh, and actually maybe this is a question for both of you. We can just, just to do justice to our, our attendees who've had some questions for a while, um, I'd like to get into those. One question we got is what are the consequences in the long run for a group that forms negative identities through falsehoods? I think they mean negative identities of others. And I know John, you touched on this. Um, and Olga, you've been tracking these narratives too that are vilifying Ukrainians as Nazis. So to both of your knowledge, um, it, it, what are the consequences in the long run uh, of this sort of brainwashing or this sort of propaganda. And I'll let uh, maybe maybe um, whichever of you wants to go first is, sounds like John, you're, you're nodding and uh, maybe you can take a crack at it and then we'll come to you, Olga. Uh, I think it's fine if Olga goes first because she's okay. had her microphone off. Yeah. No, 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 John, go ahead because I think that's uh, the topic of your expertise more than mine. Um, you really overestimate my expertise, I'm afraid. Yeah. This is an immensely complicated question. Um, the long-term consequences of this. I mean, obviously what you what you try to achieve by doing this is increase intergroup distance, right? You're trying to um, increase negative perceptions of a different group uh, among the group that you're targeting. And the very, very worst consequences of that that we can imagine that happened, for example, in the 1930s and 40s in Europe, right? Um, but it is obviously not a given, nor is it deterministic uh, that it will head in that direction necessarily. Um, what makes me a little bit optimistic, at least, is um, at the very least, uh, some people in Russia do not support this, and the, this effort has, has failed in Ukraine quite spectacularly uh, in terms of uh, increasing the distance between Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers or ethnic Ukrainians and ethnic Russians and so on, meaning presenting some sort of alternative to Ukrainian nationhood, especially for Russian speakers in the East and in the South, hasn't worked very well at all. 
So uh, in that sense, I'm at least slightly optimistic, but obviously it's impossible to predict the long-term consequences of this. Uh, if I may say one final thing, by the way, just to add to, to what Volodymyr was saying, uh, I've always found it very interesting that people who are sort of rightfully critical of Western imperialism, uh, for example, some Western journalists, but also people in other countries, right? Uh, it's completely fair to have that criticism. It makes sense to be critical of the Iraq war, for instance, obviously. But then somehow that same criticism doesn't apply when it's about Russian imperialism. I've always found that a, a funny contradiction. Sure. And Olga, I'll, I'll throw in another question as well, Olga. You can talk to this or another one that someone has asked. Um, what is Ukraine's biggest hurdle when it comes to fighting a prolonged conflict with Russia online? I think that's an interesting question in terms of, I'm thinking in terms of mental resilience and uh, is that what Russia's trying to do? Maybe wear them down. So uh, I'd leave it to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to address the question about what's the best way to deal with fake news and can counter speech be effective? Because I think this war and, you know, the uh, information war uh, surrounding it offers us some interesting insights. But first, I want to add to what Tawhid was mentioning, you know, the way uh, the, te the techniques that are being used, this uh, artificial intelligence generated images and tweets. And we've seen also the use of deep fakes, you know, that Russians were using since the start of full scale invasion, they made a deep fake with the President Zelensky, who was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, admitting the surrender, like speaking that, you, you know, Ukraine is surrendering and somehow like uh, uh, faking his uh, usual video message to Ukrainian people that he re records every day, in which he was basically saying Ukrainians that Ukraine, you know, is like, uh, is going to surrender and you have to lay down your weapons. And there was also another deep fake video where he was uh, allegedly speaking with the Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov and like apologizing to him. So at least two deep fakes that had uh, uh, received some traction on social media that Russians produced since the start of this war. And this was actually expected, you know, that they will be using deep fakes. They will be using, you know, all the, uh, uh, what the modern technology offers uh, in, in this information war. But in general, I, I think, it is fair to say now six months uh, since the invasion that actually I think Russia has not been winning the information war, but it might still change. Of course, you know, it's just been six months. Uh, obviously, like in the very first weeks and months, uh, it was fair to say that Ukraine was clearly winning because there was a lot of, you know, like messaging from Ukraine that was, they were getting traction. There was a lot of focus on Ukraine. With time, of course, that focus has been shifting and, uh, and this now addresses the question, what would be, you know, Ukraine's biggest challenge? I think Ukraine's biggest challenge uh, in winning this uh, war also online would be to keep the attention on Ukraine, focused on Ukraine, to avoid war fatigue in uh, the West and in other countries, to keep the interest of the media focused on Ukraine, because uh, journalists might leave you Ukraine. They might be less reporting from Ukraine. Ukraine might disappear from the news, but the disinformation actors will not stop operating. They will not stop working and spreading propaganda and disinformation and fighting this war online. So the biggest challenge would be to, to keep the media attention uh, and to keep the news flowing from Ukraine, to keep the, you know, the public attention, government's attention focused on Ukraine in order also to, to uh, continue the flow of support, of weapons, of uh, financial help, of political support to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, also related to this and, you know, touching upon the other question of uh, how this fake news can be countered and in general, what are the, the, the tools, you know, to combat this disinformation and propaganda? Uh, something that we are also learning from, from this war. Uh, uh, one of uh, really efficient tools that uh, uh, were previously widely used by actually Russian assets, you know, in uh, uh, both inside Russia, Russian disinformation actors um, um, that were spreading messages in, in other languages other than Russian, also by Russian officials, especially on Twitter. They were using a lot of trolling, a lot of memes to push their agenda. I think this was partially hijacked by Ukrainian actors since the start of this war. Ukraine has retaken the initiative in this in this sense. And for example, we are now seeing uh, some Ukraine Ukrainian Twitter accounts, Ukrainian official Twitter accounts. Uh, there was, for example, an account Ukraine that was already active before the full scale invasion that was producing a lot of viral content. And it was a, a case described in some international media, Washington Post. But since the full-scale invasion, we've seen more Ukrainian official accounts joining this effort, creating 
content that really becomes viral thanks to the use of humor, thanks to the use of memes, thanks to the use of, you know, trolling. Uh, I'm speaking, for example, about the account of Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Alexei Reznikov, who a few days ago changed his avatar uh, to become a NAFO fellow. And this is another phenomenon that I want to, you know, to, to mention. So like very efficient, good use of, you know, by Ukrainian officials and of course, non-official Ukrainian accounts of all these tactics that were previously widely used by Russians, but Ukrainians somehow outsmarted, uh, outwitted Russians, you know, in, in the use of uh, in the use of these tools. And yeah, and the, and the NAFO phenomenon, the last thing that I want to, uh, to address, this is also proves uh, something as very efficient uh, tactic to combat disinformation, not just debunk the fake news, but use a lot of trolling respond to uh, those who are tweeting um, disinformation content, uh, flood them with uh, memes, with answers, with gifts, you know, with like trolling uh, in order to kind of ridicule them and just show the futility of this effort. If someone is not aware what NAFO is, of course, you can go and Google because uh, I will just briefly say that this is the uh, army of uh, cartoon dogs, people who support Ukraine, Twitter users from different uh, countries who uh, donate to support the uh, Ukrainian army. And in exchange, uh, they receive this avatar of uh, NAFO stands for North Atlantic Fellow Organization, uh, like in reference to NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So like this info ops uh, army of, you know, Ukraine supporters. And uh, as I said, even Ukraine's uh, defense minister j changed his avatar a couple of days ago, thanking this NAFO fellows for, for their effort in, in the information war. So not just like debunking, taking misinformation in a very, you know, serious manner, uh, trying to uh, dispel it, counter it with facts, but also using mirror techniques, you know, the same trolling, same memes, humor, it, it turns out that it's really working and it, it helps also to keep the attention focused on news from Ukraine, on the events in Ukraine, which is of course now in Ukraine's uh, essential interest. Thank you, Olga. And uh, now I'm just gonna go a little quickly because I'm, I'm, it's wonderful to see so much interest from our attendees, some great questions. Um, I think there's one question here. John, I know that you have a lot to say on how can we counter misinfo as well. You've done some great work with the games, uh, technology and inoculation, uh, this approach of trying to immunize populations against misinformation instead of trying to counter specific narratives. So really quickly in just a minute or so, could you talk about your experience testing out that approach? Does it look promising? Do you think it could work in this context? Um, yeah, I, by the way, I really like this idea of counter trolling. That's amazing. Uh, very good idea. Please do that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a supply side and the demand side in a sense, right, in this problem, meaning there's people who supply the disinformation. You can do a few things about that, and I'm sure Tawhid would have many things to say about it, but there's also the demand side, meaning if you can't completely prevent people from being exposed to disinformation, how do you build resilience and reduce the likelihood that they're persuaded? And one of the ways to do that is by, uh, by pre-bunking this kind of content, meaning by preemptively exposing uh, uh, what kinds of techniques and tactics you're likely to be exposed to in this disinformation. Um, and that can take all kinds of forms, but a, a study that we published about a week ago, uh, we created a couple of the other short videos, five short videos that each expose one of these manipulation techniques, and we wrote them out on YouTube. And on YouTube, it turned out that people who saw these uh, videos as an ad, just a simple YouTube ad, just like you might see one for a brand, uh, we're much better than the control group at identifying these manipulation techniques. So there's some promise for the scalability of these kinds of approaches, not only with videos, but also, for example, with uh, fake news games uh, and other uh, sort of mini literacy efforts that seek to build resilience at scale. Okay, thank you. So, and and I think, Tohi, just really quick, there's a couple questions here we have about tech. I think the interesting essence of these questions is, yes, AI is getting more advanced. Yes, that's terrifying. Can that also be used for good? Are there advancements in AI happening that'll make us better able to combat disinformation, detecting disinformation easier? Anything you've seen uh, or is it all doom and gloom? I mean, I think my perspective is a bit different from the rest of the panelists. So for me, the best defense is a good offense. So like we're in a world today where there's people out there that believe the earth is flat. They, they believe this, right? There's people out there. That means that you can convince somebody of anything today. Like persuasion is a very powerful tool. 
with the AI uh, tools out there today and some clever just like strategizing, you can create, like, I think the goal shouldn't be to like fact check people. I think fact checking is counterproductive. It's my personal opinion. What's really effective is just kind of finding some different narrative that people are, are kind of already uh, leaning towards and then kind of push it in that direction. As Volomir said, the polarization is what the Russians exploit. So right now, the Russian narrative is popping up all over uh, Twitter is that the war in Ukraine is making Europeans having expensive cost of gas and heating. That's going to be a cold, cold winter because of the war. That's going to pop up a lot. You'll see like people's like gas bills on Twitter probably next couple of months. That's a very powerful narrative. And, you know, if I was the Russian, I would just like make fake accounts with small pubs in England and have them post their fake electricity bills and say, oh, my God, this war is costing me so much money. Is it worth it? Right. This, it's a tool you can use to accomplish a goal. So, you know, it's like fact checking and eh, debunking. OK, it's like nice. But I think if you really want to win the information war, you need offensive capabilities. We have them today. They're very dangerous, as you're saying. Right. I mean, if you kind of are clever with it, you could do a lot of bad things. But I think it's important for people with like that are in the positions of power, policymakers to authorize these tools to be used for specific purposes in a controlled way. But I think that the idea should be offense, that we can persuade people in the other direction to maybe make them stop fighting the war, for instance. And yeah. that's what AI can probably do in the future. So it's not all doom and gloom. It's more like a brave new world where, you know, the game is persuasion using AI to make people just, you know, ah, the war's dumb. Forget about it. Let's not bother with it. So thank, thanks. That's an interesting approach. So it's, it could escalate. But, uh, but yes, there is some stuff that tech can do to help the other side. And, and I think we've got time just for one more question. I want to get to this, uh, this question about, uh, and maybe uh, Volodymyr and Olga, you might be best positioned to answer, that in the first days of the war, the Ukrainian government launched a few initiatives targeting Russians and aimed to either disseminate accurate news about the war or appeal to the mothers of Russian soldiers to stop the war. And a lot of Ukrainians picked up these, uh, tried to reach out to Russians via social media. Do you think that was effective or did it backfire and have the effect of nurturing hate and strengthening anti-Ukrainian sentiments among Russians who supported the special operation from the very beginning? So a complicated question, but uh, hopefully you can unpack it for us. Yeah, well, it's very difficult to, you know, assess uh, the efficiency of this uh, strategy. And I know that that has been done not just as a part of some government uh, strategy, but like a lot of Ukrainians were uh, spontaneously reaching out to their relatives in Russia, like for example, my father, he's still trying to talk with uh, his uh, niece who is from Ukraine, but who has been living in Russia for decades and speaking about, you know, like on a very like personal subjects about people she also knows, like and saying, well, this person, you know him and he went to fight and he was wounded by the Russian army here in Ukraine. So somehow trying to sensibilize, you know, them addressing like really familiar topics and mentioning uh, uh, relatives, people, you know, they also know, but uh, he was surprised to find out that her response was like well it was was his own choice you know like we are not responsible for it so as if it wasn't russia that invaded as if it he did not have to go uh, to fight because his country was invaded and he had to defend you know his country and his loved ones here so uh, what is very often you know ukrainians experienced when trying to reach out to russians like this barrier and this uh, in many cases, a conscious choice not to believe the truth, not to believe the facts, not to believe uh, the, you know, uh, horror that Russia is actually committing here in Ukraine. I think it's it's too early now to judge whether these efforts were futile or maybe they will have some impact in, in the long run. I, I, I want to be optimistic and believe that, you know, it will have some cumulative effect. And with the inflow, you know, this information coming and people at the back of their minds knowing that they are just choosing not to believe what is actually happening, choosing not to believe in all the horrors that the Russian army is inflicting upon Ukraine, uh, that one day, you know, it will still dawn on them and, and there will be some reckoning with this truth that they now do not want to see and do not want to believe in. Thank you. And uh, Volodymyr, if you, if you would like to jump in, please feel free. Well, Olga said it's all uh, just one remark. I think if you want to uh, instigate some empathy uh, among Russians, it's, it's not a very good way to proceed. But um, I think one of the counter narratives like Tahid was mentioning is that Russians really want their country to be great. And uh, the fantastic thing is that uh, 
when you ask people on the Russian streets, when we see reports from Radio Libich or some others like Vox Pop, uh, they're really thinking that their country since 24th of February has become greater. So they, they don't really um, notice the fact that, that they're actually, uh, if we take the democratic, the free world uh, to which they want to actually belong uh, subconsciously, uh, that it, it, it increasingly despises them. Uh, so I think the, the, the task is to, to create this kind of a feeling of reality and to create that feeling that was present in the latest stages of the Soviet Union when suddenly you realize that, okay, you're living in the totalitarian state, but you just hate this state. Uh, maybe, but it, it is not, it is not, a, it is, it is, might be a very long process actually. No worries. Well, thank you. And I know we've got a few other questions and some people have privately messaged saying they, they're going to have to drop out for their next engagement, but uh, but they have left us their contact info. So we will get back to them with the um, uh, with whatever answers we can provide. Um, and, and I know we're a little over time, so I'm a, I know we could keep talking for, for so long. All of you have so much uh, amazing things and insights to contribute to this discussion. Um, so I'd like to just, if I could, wrap it up here and thank all of our attendees uh, and panelists. Um, and I know that all of you are so busy. So thank you for taking out the time to have this important discussion. Uh, we've left some resources in the chat, uh, reports and whatnot that you can look at. Please uh, follow all of our speakers on social media for more of their insights, more of their work. And of course, you can also follow Mythos Labs uh, to see what we're up to. So thank you all very, very much. Have a great rest of your day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.